I see we got a bottle of wine over there. How many of y'all do burning? <laughs> yeah, burning doesn't drive you to drinking it, can you? <laughs> no. Um, what I titled this, Selection of Engagement Techniques to Achieve Resource Objectives. What I wanted to do was try and go kind of quick, because it's like the preacher talking to the choir, and then we'll take some questions. Obviously, we all burn for a lot of different reasons. I'm not going to read the list. But there's a lot of reasons we burn, and you get multiple benefits. I personally, before I, I thin a timber stand, I like to run a fire through, do a pre-marking burn. And when you do that, you get hazard fuel reduction, right? You get some wildlife benefits. So just remember, burning can achieve multiple you know, benefits. So typically, you want to pick what's called the resource objective. That's the reason you burn. Now, once you have your resource objective, then you're going to come up with your fire objective. Okay, what objectives Flame links, rate of spread, time of year are going to achieve my resource objective. So you think two different ways. Resource objective, why do I burn? And then we'll get to the prescription, the fire objective. I want to give you a real quickie on fire regimes, a little fire ecology. Now this is just the way the good Lord made it. Okay, most of the southeast U.S. is a fire regime one. It's a very frequent 0 to 35 year return interval, and it's a low intensity fire. That's just how... For thousands of years, the southeast fuels have evolved. Whether you're in the mountains of the Appalachians, it's fairly frequent, somewhere from zero to 35 year return interval or rotation, and it typically is a low intensity fire. The fire regime two is that same zero to 35 year return interval, but it's what's called a stay and replacement fire. In grass systems, when you burn a grass system, that's a stay and replacement fire. You're actually taking off the whole top layer and it's going to come back from sprouts. So a grass fire is a standard replacement fire. Then you get a, a fire regime three, and a lot of southeast types are that. It's 35 to 100 years is the normal frequency they burn, and when they do, it's mixed severity. You get some low intensity fire, and you get some standard replacement. I mean, it's blowing holes in the canopy, and there's places it's crawling, and then everything in between. When Okie Finoki burns every four years, that's a typical zero, 35 to 100 year return interval, mixed severity. You get places, I mean, it rips and roars, right? Takes off canopy, and then you get other places it's creeping. Fire regime four is a 35 to 100 year return interval stand replacement. And that's what you get in things like sand pine, which is a southeast species. Typically, when they burn, they go one way. They're going to burn through the crown, a crown fire, black sticks when it's done. But it's evolved that way. That's why they have serotonous cones. They regenerate from these high intensity fires. When you see lodgepole pine out west, uh, chaparral in California, those are standard replacement regimes. That's how they're supposed to burn. When they burn, you don't want to be standing nearby. They're going to go hard. But that's natural. So, next thing you think about is condition class. As you look at your land, you say, okay, I basically got this uh, 0 to 35 year return interval, low intensity fire. Now, my next question is, am I in a low risk or high risk? Condition class, you just think of it, how many return intervals have you missed? How out of whack is your stand? And that's going to help you write your prescription. What I use at the bottom, the relative risk that a missed return interval is going to cause a loss of a key component of an ecosystem. If you have wiregrass systems, or gopher tortoise habitat, something that's in good shape. If you turn the fire off, it's going to change, right? So you're going to lose that ecosystem component. You're going to lose that wire grass. You're going to lose that gopher tortoise presence. They're going to pack up and leave. So you can turn fire off or mess with it and cause these higher risk of losing those components. So something like that, you know, we picture, okay, upland pine, fairly frequent. When that would burn, it's obviously going to be a low intensity fire because the fuel load is not high. That looks really nice. It may or may not support certain kinds of species, but that's what we consider a condition class one. It's in good shape. It receives fairly frequent fire return intervals. Okay, now, a lot of different ways to light it, right? You can do it hand lighting with matches, fusees, drip torches, uh, hand ignition with the the PSDO plastic sphere dispenser operator, the little things like you see where you can pump the, the ping pong balls out by hand. 
light off the ATV, drop balls from a helicopter, a lot of ways of doing the ignition. This is very common anymore because you have a, a lot of efficiency. Um, you know, you have a four-wheeler water on the front, a burn tank on the back, allows you to set fire, allows you to mop up and patrol, catch spots. So that, that's good because if you're burning a lot of acres a day, you know, do you want to ride six miles or do you want to walk six miles? So you can do more, you can be more efficient. It's not about just doing more acres, it's about being efficient. So again, the mechanized system's good. Next consideration is why well, am I going to light it? Am I going to let it back? Am I going to run ahead and fire? Am I going to let it flank? There's a lot of different ignition strategies to again reach your um, your objective. This can do, uh, this class, you know, it's a five-year-old lob lolly stand. So on Seahoy Plantation, we planted like ten little rows of pines in the middle of a big brood field for quail. So we're not really growing timber. We're providing a little. Uh, diversity by planting trees in the middle. So when we burn that for the first time, our gut tells us I want a cool fire, right? First time I've burned it. So I want the air temperature to be cold. I want high humidity. And I want to use the backing fire. I want it to crawl through there. So you kind of already know that. But again, you don't want to mess up a good backing fire. Even though those flame links are like six inches long, what would happen if you moved just 50 feet over and lit it? It's going to stand up and go, even on a moist day. So if you don't need to have a fast-moving fire, don't screw up a good backing fire. Okay, here's another stand that's 15 years old it's in Chambers County. We're fixing to thin this stand. That's the landowner. A lot of ladder fuels we picked today. It was almost like today. It was like 60% humidity. It was damp. You could just feel it. And you know what? It burned really, really good. You know, on a drier day, it probably would have burned a little too hot, but that first burn was perfect. Now, we had three-foot flames. It did really good. Then we put a logging crew in there, and they thinned it. The, the pre-marking burning really helped the, the crew do a better job of thinning, but you got to pick the right day to, uh, to do that. Now, we talked about resource objective. Why burn? Now we're going to talk about the fire objective. This is your prescription. And this is how you have to think so you have success. Most people think when they burn, you just go out and set fire and hope things work out. No, we can do much better than that. It's very predictable. Once you understand the science, there's no surprises. You'll have a successful outcome. But here's the things you've got to consider. And, and most of this is probably great to you, but if you attend these burn certifications for the Forestry Commission to become a certified burn manager, you're going to learn all this. But it depends. What's the fuel model? Is it litter? Is it grass? Is it logging debris? What flame length do you want? Do you need a two-foot flame length? you need a 12-foot flame length? Six-foot? Four-foot? You tell me. So once you start to come up with your prescription, you know, if you're going to back a fire through a young plantation and you don't want anything above a three-foot flame length, it really doesn't matter if it's a foot and a half and you just want it three feet or less. So you can model what kind of weather parameters are going to give you a three foot or less flame length. What kind of rate of spread do you want? You want a fast mover? You want it to move slow? You want it to back? You want it to run? You know, when you're burning long leaf stands, often we want a head fire. You're burning uh, while the buds are, haven't opened up yet and you want to flash a fire through there quickly. So that's a head fire. That's a little scary because you're going to see 10, 12, 15 foot flames, but it's over with pretty quick. Then you want to make sure it doesn't blow out on the other end of your burn unit. But in order to achieve success, you want a fast move and a high rate of spread. So there's ways you can calculate that. And then uh, the dryness, KBDI, what month, uh, time of the year do you want to burn? All of these things go into your fire objective. Now, I'm going to lead to an example. Think about it. You've got this fire regime, fairly frequent, low intensity fire. And your objective is, last time it was burned was three years ago, it was done in, say, February. But your objective is control of undesirable species. You want to begin to convert this 10 foot tall brush. And you want to start knocking that down. So you want to get this native ground cover. You want to turn it more into the grasses and the forbs. But right now it's 8 to 10 feet and it's thick. And it, just because you burn it in the winter, you're not getting enough heat to top kill. So if that's your objective, 
Now you have to think, of what's my fire objective? How can I achieve this goal? Well, first of all, how am I going to light it? You say, well, I'm going to light it with a hand torch. That's okay. Next thing is, how do you want to light it? Well, you're going to need to generate some intensity. So you might say, I'm going to light spots, and I'm going to use a strip head fire. I need it to kind of move through the stand. And in the month, I want to burn in May and June. Because in order to start controlling that big hardwood, I've got to think, I've got to get out of the dormant season. I've got to start burning May, June, July, August, some other time of the year if I want to achieve that objective. So then you start writing your prescription, and these things come out. All right, I want to burn mid to late May. I want the, the dryness, the KBDI to be 400 or less. And a lot of this you may not understand right now. You would if you attended the burn course. But it's about helping you write your prescription so you'll hit the mark. You want it 80 to 95 degrees. You've got to get some heat going. You want the humidity to be between 45 and 60 percent. You're burning this fuel model nine, which is lit. You want these fuel moistures. You want eye level winds two to four. These things start shaking out. That's your prescription. So when you write your plan, you say, if I go out on that kind of day, I should achieve success. Because you can't guess that. You just can't go out there and say, well, I think today's a good day. You've got to understand the science to be successful. So here's an example. This is in Macon County. It pretty much fits what I just wrote, other than the brush isn't 8 to 10 feet tall. This is a 14-year-old stand. We thinned it a year before. It was a very clean stand, just needles on the ground. And within a year, that's how much hardwood starts to come back. So we went in there and burned this thing in June. And I lit spots. You can see the flame length's only about two to two and a half feet. But when it's 85 to 90 degrees, and I got a two foot flame length that's moving maybe 500 feet per hour, not real fast, it's making that heat. And it's just cooking that little bitty hard with those tender leaves, as you're gonna see. That's what it looked like a week later. Now, does that look anything real scary like, oh my God, call the forest service, call the air tankers? No. So when you burn, once you understand that's exactly what I need, a lot of people would say, you know, flame leak was nothing. That, you know, that was a bad burn. No. A week later, there you go. Now, next week, you know, all I did was make it mad. But it went from eight feet high and it's going to sprout. But now it's down here. So again, that's a very inexpensive way of controlling hardwood because if you didn't do that, another year that sweet gum would be the size of a Coke can and you're not going to control it. Now you have to use herbicide. So timely fire, but it's not a guesswork. You come up with your resource objective, hardwood control. Now you've got to write your prescription, your fire objective, what month, what method of ignition, what flame leak, what spread rate. Those are the things that I'm going to think that I have to have to achieve success. Otherwise, you're guessing at it. So, that's good. A lot of people think that's bad, but that's really good. You're converting all that woody stuff. And now next year, you're going to have a tremendous amount of grasses and forbs and weeds, more insects, better habitat for turkeys. It looks nice. It's easier to walk through. It's just a more natural system. Then, when you do thin a stand, a lot of that dead stuff, you beat it down. And you can tell this is an area in Macon County. We actually did that kind of growing season burn, and within a year we went in there and did another thinning. It's a different track, but it beat all that stuff down. And now it's going to be nothing but weeds and forbs. It's really converted it from a typical thick stand to something you can almost run through, you know, with a pair of sandals on, if that's what your objective is. So here's some suggestions. I want to leave time for questions. If you're already not, consider becoming a certified prescribed burn manager in Alabama or whatever state you may live in. That doesn't mean that you're going to get into burning business. But if you're a landowner and you do burning for yourself, if you're a landowner and you have other people burn, you want to know what's going on, right? Knowledge is power. So you want to understand the science and the ecology. So if you become a certified burn manager, whether you do any burning or not, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to learn all about this science, about fuel models and how you can calculate flame lengths and rate of spread and the intelligent tinkering to know what kind of prescriptions give me this kind of result. If you go to that four-day workshop, 
become certified, you'll learn a tremendous amount. So we want you to become certified. And also become a member of the Prescribed Fire Council for whatever state you're in. In Alabama, we have an Alabama Prescribed Fire Council. You saw our display. It's, it doesn't cost anything to join. Remember, we represent the wise and safe use of prescribed fire for practitioners in Alabama. That's what we're all about. So we represent landowners. We want to help you give you all the tools possible so you can read and study and, and understand about fire ecology. And then obviously be an advocate for again the safe and expanded use of fire because think about it. How many people are out there that don't understand why in the world you set the woods on fire? Now you're a landowner, you get it. But there's more people that don't get it that do get it. And they don't need to be telling you what you can and can't do just because I don't like smoke. I don't like the smell. I think that looks bad. They're infringing on your right. So you need to be an advocate. You need to stand up. And, and, and smack down, you know, stuff that's bad science. So how do you do that? Well, you need to understand the science. And just adopt the mindset. Every day is a burn day. Don't miss opportunities to be out there doing good proactive work. Now, every day you can't be dropping the match, but you can be doing planning. You can be doing your burn plans. You can be thinking about it. You can read up on it. You can learn about the ecology. You just want to be armed with all the information. Because this is really the definition of what prescribed fire is. It's a safe way, that's a key word, it's a safe way of applying a natural process, ensuring ecosystem health, and reducing the risk of wildland fire. There's nothing new under the sun. I mean, that's written in Ecclesiastic, but it's the same with fire science. Once you understand the science, <laughs> as Ken Handy used to say, it takes the voodoo out of fire. There's no surprises. It's a physical reaction to inputs and outputs. So once you understand it, you're not going to get surprised. But too many people are burning and they're scared to death of it because they don't know. People are only afraid of what they don't know. But once you understand it, you can be bold. Now you need to be careful. It's inherently dangerous. But remember, you can do your part. So that was quick, but I wanted to save time for questions. But the take-home message is come up with your reason to burn, your resource objective. Wildlife habitat, fuel reduction, pre-marking, whatever. Then you come up with your prescription, your fire objective. How do I light it? What month? How fast? How much flame length? All of those science-based things. Then you can write your plan, and then you implement your plan, and you'll have success. I can almost guarantee it. There's no surprises. So that's the professional way to do it. Y'all are the landowners. You own the bulk of the resources. You want good work done on your land that's sustainable, and prescribed fire is a huge, it's the most cost-effective thing in your arsenal. So don't let the science scare you. Learn about it, and whoever you engage to help you with it, hold them accountable. That's why we have a certification process. So I know that was really quick. Be glad to take some questions.